Oh, good afternoon, brethren. Certainly is good to see everybody here today. It seems like I've been gone for a long time, um, but we're back now, and it is a beautiful day that we've got out there. We are missing a few people, but a few extra people showed up, so it's kind of just makes everything really nice, really nice Sabbath day. I'd like to welcome everybody that's hooked up via the, uh, the phone hookup, or we'll see this DVD at a, at a future time. We're certainly glad to have you here in Warden with us today. And it is time to begin services, so I'll call Mr. Eric Lee to come forward for the opening prayer. Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath day, and thank you, Father, for the weekly reminder we do have about your plan and, and what you have in store. And Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to come together as a family and to learn more about that. And please, Father, just place your presence here. Please inspire the speaking and inspire our hearing, and please help us to glean what you would like us to get from this message. And please, Father, just be with all your people around the world. Be with those that are sick and need your intervention, and please just place your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother, if you'll take your songbooks and turn over to page number 36 for our first selection, we'll sing some words from the 46th Psalm today. It's come see the works of God. Again, that's page number 36. few pages to page number 40 for our next hymn. Sing words taken from the last 17 verses of the 50th Psalm. Give thanks and offer praise. It's page number 40.
next selection, if you'll turn back towards the front of the book, to page number 14, we'll sing, Who Shall Dwell on Thy Holy Hill? And it's page number 14. You may be seated. Now to bring us today's message is Mr. Steve Buchanan. Well, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Good afternoon to all of you. Great to see everyone here. Hopefully everybody's doing well. Greetings to those who may be on the call-in line. Hopefully all of you are having a great Sabbath. I'd like to begin by asking if you would turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, we're going to begin reading here with verse 19. We're breaking into the thought uh, Christ has been arrested, and he is now beginning to face questions here, uh, beginning with verse 19. It says, The high priest then asked Jesus <clears throat> about his disciples and his doctrine. Probably in this situation, the high priest is coming at this from a legal perspective. Try, he's certainly trying to find anything that he can allege against Christ for doing anything wrong. Asking about his disciples, no doubt asking about the number, asking about what they are saying, what they are doing, as well as Christ's own teaching himself. Verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. And if you remember, whether it was last year, year before, I, time moves so fast, but we went over the last week of Christ's life. And we remember that on a daily basis, Jesus Christ went to the temple to teach his people from there he would leave, go over the Mount of Olives, and stay with Martha and Mary. So we have that daily uh, trip that Jesus Christ would make as far as his teaching. So he's, he's telling the high priest here, listen, I was out there, I was teaching. You can ask any of the people that were here what I was teaching and what my doctrine is. Verse 21, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. Verse 22, and when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? So at this point, this individual interpreted what Christ said as a statement of disrespect before the high priest and hit him. If you wanted to go through the legal aspects, all of that is illegal. There is no abuse that was allowed to Christ at all because at this point, they're striving to find something to charge him with, but he has not been charged. He has not been indicted. So everything that's taken place with this hit 
is illegal, but of course we see nothing being done about that. Going on, verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Verse 24, then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. I'd like to go from here to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, we'll begin reading here with verse 53. Christ has been sent to the high priest, and this is what Christ faces at this point. Verse 53. It says, and they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. So again, in this legal proceeding, it not only required the high priest there, but all of the elders and scribes, in other words, those who were the leadership, those who were the council of elders at that time, needed to be there for this meeting. Verse 54. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Right up front, and as we all understand, their motive here is they want Christ dead. They want him eliminated because of the threat that he presents to them in taking away the leadership and taking away their following. We understand all of that. Verse 56, For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. They could find people who would lie, but they couldn't get any, all of them to agree. Verse 57, Then some rose up, bore false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? All of this time, all of these testimonies, Christ said nothing. He just let everything transpire. Verse 61, but he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, as we would put ourselves in his place, having done nothing wrong, having said nothing wrong, how many of us would be willing to sit there and say nothing? How many of us would not be resisting what's being said against us? He chose to say nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is not something that they, they would accept. As true as it is, they could not understand it. They would not accept it. Verse 63, then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. We don't see any abstinence of any of those council members all of them, it seems, voted for him to die. Goes on, verse 65, Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him and to beat him, and to say to him, Prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. So the beating, again, happens here. Not only that, but the words, we don't have record of what the words were, that were directed toward him. Again, place yourself there. How many of us could resist all of this and just allow it to take place? I'd like to go back to John. John chapter 19 this time.
The high priest now is going to bring him before Pilate. Chapter 19, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. If you want to back up to chapter 18, beginning with verse 28, Pilate asks him many questions, finds no fault in him, and presents it before those in Israel saying, I find no fault in him, but this time of year I'm allowed to free somebody. Can we free Christ? They say, no, free Barabbas. He was a thief, and they wanted him freed, but they wanted Christ crucified. That's what, again, the words that constantly were said and the feeling behind them. So chapter 19, verse 1, then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And again, I, we've mentioned this in the past, with Satan being involved, with God allowing Satan the parameters by which he was able to work, this scourging, it had to be something horrific to happen, as we're going to see. Verse 2, And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Again, beating him on top of the scourging, that had already taken place. Verse 4, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So Pilate brings him out. At this point, it appears still clothed with this robe, so perhaps the people couldn't see to the degree that Christ had been scourged and beat, but he had this this twisted thorn crown on his head with this purple robe when this took place. Verse 5, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to them, behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him for I find no fault in him. As we know from this point, Israel threw on Pilate that he was speaking against Caesar. Caesar feared his position, and he went back in to talk to Christ and eventually ordered for his crucifixion. At this point, Jesus had been beaten and scourged, was presented to the people. The screams of hatred and emotion were impacting him. He could hear it all. And all of this from people that he was responsible for as their creator. All of this taking place with him. If you'll go back to Isaiah chapter 53, scriptures that we're very familiar with. Isaiah chapter 53, we'll read here with verse 4. It says, surely he has borne our griefs. The physical pains of the body, he carried those. He carried our sorrows, speaking of the pains mentally and emotionally of the mind. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Those certainly that were present there at his trial, those who witnessed all that had taken place, they did not see what they were doing. They did not understand who they were doing it to. But all of them had an effect on Christ. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, for our rebellions, for our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities, our individual faults, our individual transgressions, all of us. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Back in the previous chapter, verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, 
So his visage or his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. All of this to Christ who had done nothing wrong. If you'll turn to John chapter 19 once again. John chapter 19, we'll begin reading here with verse 28. Christ is hanging on the stake. He's nearing his death. Verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Christ, more than any other human being, understood every single Old Testament prophecy that had been made that pertained to him and his death. This last thing that he requests here when he says, I thirst, is the only remaining Old Testament prophecy that had not been fulfilled up to this point, save his death. He says, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it up to his mouth. At this point, Christ understood that everything that had been prophesied pertaining to his death was fulfilled. It had been accomplished. He knew it. Verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. All of it was done. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came, broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him, But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So when he said, bowing his head, he said it was finished, he bowed his head and he gave up the spirit. It was at that point that the soldier's spear pierced his side. We could read more. But these are some of the things that Jesus experienced that was judged necessary by his Father that he experienced, that he suffer, and that he endure. Almost all people that were present at his trial, that most of them that were even present there at his death, hated him, inflicted pain on him with words, with punches, with scourging, and with this ultimate crucifixion. Before this began, Christ knew what was designated for him to experience and endure. You don't have to turn there, but Matthew chapter 26, verse 2, it was after he had talked about, in Matthew 24, 25, the Olivet Prophecy, when they left there, He made the statement, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. He knew what was designated for him to happen. He knew the beatings were going to take place. He knew the hatred was going to be there. He knew that a soldier's spear was going to stick him in the side. He knew he was going to be crucified. He was the one in heaven that inspired the prophecies of this and the surrounding events that was destined to happen. This perfect life, this spotless example, all of us should still be learning depths of today to instill in our lives, in our thinking, in what we feel. With all of this done to him, he did it for all of mankind. He desired all to have the potential to enter his family. 
But knowing all of this was going to happen does not change the fact that all through it, with everything being hurled at him, that he still had to make choices. He still had to act in a godly way in the midst of all of it, or this sacrifice is not spotless and blameless any longer. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 53, probably should have had you put markers in these places. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed, which means hard-pressed. It was, a, it was a, a situation, circumstances he was under that he felt the pressure. He felt it. It was there. And he was afflicted. He was looked down upon, certainly by all that were there that was experienced. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Once again, it's not that he didn't open his mouth to answer questions to high priest and to Pilate. But when it says here he didn't open his mouth, he didn't resist. He didn't resist the judgment of God that he have to endure all of this. If you go to Luke chapter 23... Verse 32, there were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do and they divided his garments and cast lots. All the words directed at him, all the beatings and the scourgings that he received from the soldiers, the soldiers that pierced his side, the words spoken to him by Pilate that judged that he has to be crucified, the words from Caiaphas, the high priest, from all of the elders, from those that beat him, put the mask over his head and beat him, taunting him to prophesy who had done that to him. All of those people are included in these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If this request was just a show to fulfill prophecy, if that's all it was, then it weakens the sacrifice that Christ gave. He felt this when he stated it. He desired that his Father forgive them and not hold them accountable for what they had done to him. This represented, these words represented his love for all mankind. Even those present then, heavily deceived, not understanding who he was, not able to understand the truth. When you consider all the hatred directed at him, this request is powerful. Again, how many of us enduring all that he did would feel that way? Or would we not seek vengeance would we not have hatred toward others? We have read these words so much that I hope it never diminishes the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what it represents. So much more than just the giving of his life. But it's the example that he set that represents his love for all of us. Just prior to Christ making this request, 
He states words that are not normally focused on and represents a prophecy for both those that were present there as well as for those that had yet to be born. I'd like to go to verse 26 of chapter 23. It says, Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus had been scourged, was weakened to a point that he was having trouble carrying his own stake, so they got Simon to come and carry it for him. Verse 27, And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. It wasn't that 100% of every single person he ever came in contact with wasn't feeling for him. Here is a group of people who were mourning for him, who were lamenting that he had to experience all of this. Verse 28, But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Christ states that there would come a time where people would long to die, and they would see their children suffer situations that was going to tear at their heart. It would not be until 70 AD that the temple would be overrun and destroyed there in Jerusalem. Well, there are probably some in that day when it did occur that would wish to die rather than experience all that was going to take place during that siege. The question that I want to ask all of us, what do these words signify for us today? How important is the example that Christ set for us as we think about the prophecies that have yet to be filled, the times that we may have to experience and live through? Are we doing today what is necessary to prepare ourselves for what God has judged will occur on this earth? If you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them to hell or to Tartaru, that place of restraint and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. As we think about that time of Noah, remember when God made the judgment that the whole world, save Noah and his family, were going to die was 120 years prior to the time whenever those floods came. So even when God made the judgment, there were many, many years that was going to take place. And how many of those years was Noah and his family busy building that ark? I have seen evidences throughout the studies I've done that they appear, there appears to be anywhere from 55 to 75 years of actual work on the ark to construct. And in all that time, it wasn't just that they were there to build the ark. Noah was preaching and warning people constantly throughout all of that time, all those years. How many people during this day were scoffing at him? Heard the words over and over and over again not believing what he was saying, not believing it was going to happen, but yet one day it did. Verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. 
and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Not that Lot was perfect. Not every choice he made was wise. But God honored what he understood and what he held on to. Verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. God has determined there is going to come a day of judgment. How many years does he give people to repent? How much time does he give people to understand that God's judgments will occur and to take seriously the lives that they have to live before him? Again, God is capable of delivering people out of temptations who are responding to God the way they should, and those who don't will be under judgment. Verse 10, And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed, They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. And is that not an attitude we see all around us today? No authority is respected. Everybody is so eager to speak out against everyone. It doesn't matter what position they hold. And it has affected the church. It has. Verse 11, Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. You could go back to the ninth verse of Jude, where it talks about there that angels will not even bring an accusation against Satan and his demons, but they say, God will be your judge. Again, an example. How many of us are innocent of that? I'm not. I've said things that I shouldn't have said. God gives me an opportunity to repent. All of us, how much has this world affected us? God's prophecies will come to pass. His judgments will occur in God's time. God will protect and provide for his people who follow the lead of his spirit and make choices accordingly, no matter the situations and circumstances God allows to happen to them as individuals. And God will be the one who judges those who make choices that are very unwise along the way. The title of today's message is, Will We Heed God's Warning? And this will be part one. When we consider the fact of how God views each of us individually and how he judges each of us individually, probably every single one of us may have some clues as to what he might say. As most will do, we will have reasons why we act the way we do. And because of that, we tend to justify ourselves in our choices and our decisions. Just in looking at my own life, I have always tried to make decisions that I think are best, that are right, only later in life to have things revealed to me that says, boy, you really were screwed up. You didn't see the truth. You didn't act accordingly. You may have hurt people, you certainly hurt yourself, but you may have hurt others as well. This way of life that God calls us to and begins a work in us is to mold and shape in us a character that's ready to inherit all things, and it involves many instances and situations where he corrects us He proves to us that we are wrong, and it's our responsibility to acknowledge our own sins individually before God, to seek repentance, 
and to change. When I think of Job and what he experienced under God's plan for him, Job made decisions, said words, had emotions after everything that was allowed to occur to him that were not right. But all along the way, Job would justify every single one of those words. Again, as I look at my life, those emotional situations at the time, I would justify all my words, all my thoughts, only later that God having mercy on me, giving me an opportunity to understand what was truly in me, gave me the opportunity to acknowledge my sins and gave me the opportunity to repent and to change. That is a way of life for every single person called to become part of the family of God. Nobody skips out on those parts. We all have that. We can all understand how Job reasoned the way he did, and we can certainly understand the way each of us reasoned the way we did. But as we look through our own eyes, we justify so many of our choices and our decisions. How we try to see things from God's eyes as to how we each measure up, I think, begins exactly where God began with Job in correcting him to help him see what God saw in him. I'd like to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. We'll begin reading here with verse 26. It says, For you see, this Greek word is B-L-E-P-O, and it means to look to, to direct the mind upon, to consider, or take heed. Probably better translated, it should be consider, think about, meditate on your calling. And as I think about my calling when I was baptized, compared to how I'm able to consider and think about my calling today, it's different. It's grown. What I am able to count the cost for today is different than how I counted the cost at my baptism. And again, it's by the instruction and the knowledge and the truth that God gives that we're able to consider more fully today than we have in the past. But it says to consider your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, or as the flesh is going to reason. It's not wise, it's not wise before God, but it's the wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. This Greek word is dunatos, D-U-N-A-T-O-S, and it means mighty man, powerful strong. Not many noble, that meaning has more of a person that is of well-born stock, born into a rich, privileged family, or those who are of high rank. Not many noble are called. So God does not use the same standards that mankind uses. But it goes on to say, but God has chosen the foolish things. This Greek word is moros, M-O-R-O-S. And again, as God uses these terms, this is his judgment, his definition. It means silly, stupid, foolish, from which the English word moron is derived. It's used of persons meaning morally worthless, it is a more serious reproach than raka, which scorns a man by calling him stupid, whereas moros scorns him concerning his heart and character. So this is more than just calling somebody a name. But God is calling those who morally and of a nature are lacking. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things. 
this Greek word is A-S-T-H-E-N-E-S. And it means strengthless. In various applications, literally, figuratively, and morally. More feeble, impotent, sick, without strength, weak. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. This Greek word is different than the mighty that was used earlier. This Greek word is I-S-C-H-U-R-O-S. And it means boisterous, mighty, powerful, strong, valiant. This is not just those who are perceived to be that way, but they see themselves that way, and they're boasting about it. They're boisterous about it. God has called the weak and base to put to shame those who are proud in themselves. Goes on, verse 28, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, this Greek word is E-X-O-U-T-H-E-N-E-O, and it means contemptible, least esteemed, said it not. God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. This Greek word for nothing is K-A-T-A-R-G-E-O. It's really comprised of two Greek words, kata, which is to be, to render entirely idle. I'm sorry, to be or to render is what kata means. R-G-O means entirely idle or useless. So God does all this to bring to nothing, to render entirely useless the things that are, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence, not the weak and the base, not the high and the proud. Nobody to glory in the presence of God. Verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness. And what we're talking about here, what Christ becomes to all of us, it begins here with Christ revealing and helping us to understand the wisdom and the righteousness of God and sanctification and redemption. In other words, by process, we grow to understand what it is to be set apart and to be bought back and redeemed in that privileged position before God. Verse 31, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the, in the Lord. This world's judgments reward those who are well-born, who are mighty, who are intellectual, who look good, present themselves well, God says, I'm going to choose exactly the opposite of what your judgments are. That is what I'm going to do, and I do it so that every single person can understand it's only by the power of God that any hope of entering his presence is possible. This is his plan and how he has judged he does this to prove his might, his power. But notice verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 26. Those who are called should be able to see and understand their calling. They should be un able to understand what God is doing all of this for. It certainly includes the mindset of understanding that our calling has nothing to do with our physical stature. But each of us must come to deeply understand that our dependence is on God for us to grow, for us to ever see the day where we enter the family of God. As you think back to your baptism, as I have thought back to mine, I don't know that any of our baptisms here in this room really mirror each other. I feel there are some differences probably in each. For me, I am a second generation Christian. My coming to baptism is different than my parents coming to baptism. 
I remember my parents talking about their very first visit to the church. CK and L of I there in Belleville, that uh, they walked into the room. We had tr- I remember us having trouble finding the place, getting lost, and actually walking in right as the piano was playing. And Dad and Mom told me back then that they felt like they were the smallest in the room. They felt like they didn't belong. They felt guilty. They felt they were sinners, that they were coming into people who were more righteous, more knowledgeable than they. In other words, they saw themselves as the smallest in the room. For me as a second generation Christian, I don't know that I got exactly to that point. I got a good distance that way, but I think that feeling has even grown for me the longer that I've been in the church. We were called as the weak and the base of this world. I want to compare that mindset, and all of you can think back to your baptism when you were first called in that first entrance into the room and how you felt I want to compare that again by going to very familiar scriptures in Revelation chapter 3. I think all of us believe and understand that this speaks of our day and time. Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write... These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. God understands, and it's in each of the letters, God is monitoring what each individual is doing with what he has provided them. And it's labeled here as works. What we do with it. The words we say how we respond to all of those impactful situations that we receive from the world. I know your works, and here's his judgment, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. I wish you were useful in some respect. But he goes on to say, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You will be, the judgment is, you will be expelled from the body of Christ. Those who are under this judgment. And again, think back through your life. All the choices that you've made, all the decisions that you've made, you always believed was right. And you will always justify your reasonings, your emotions, your hurts, and how you react to it. Verse 17, Christ details what he sees in the character of these individuals that he's judging. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing... In other words, people who once saw themselves as the smallest in the room no longer see themselves that way. No longer do they grow in this humility before God. But now they rise up and say, I'm smarter than you, I have more than you. That's certainly the world in which we live. Has it not affected the church? Has it affected me? That's what it comes down to. All of what takes place out here, how does it affect you? It goes on to say, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You don't see yourselves as you truly are. You have become deceived about yourself. Those words there, we can say it's talking about some other group, some other person. We better take it personally. 
we better consider our calling. We better consider the state that our character, that our heart and mind are at today because none of us want to be included in this judgment. I want to stop here. I'm sorry, let's, let's go to the first words of verse 18. I counsel you, Speaking of those individuals that have that situation, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire. I want you to hold your place and turn back to Zechariah chapter 13. Let's understand what Christ is saying. Zechariah chapter 13, we'll begin reading here with verse 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. It certainly happened in Christ's day. When he died, his disciples were scattered. They deserted him. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire. It's going to be hardships, it's going to be tests and circumstances that are going to be life-threatening. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined. The purpose that God has for allowing that to happen is to purify and refine the character of people, the heart and mind, what we think is right, what we truly love. God wants to refine all of it and test them as gold is tested. The result of that, they will call on my name and I will answer them. The attitude changes, it comes back to God, and God responds to them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, The Lord is my God. They're not saying that I am rich and powerful and understand all things. Their heart comes back to the fact that their life relies on God. Continue to hold your place there and turn to Malachi chapter 3, just a few pages forward. Verse 1. It says, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness, bringing through the fire to be refined, to be purified. As we go back to Revelation 3, verse 18 It says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire. God is telling the people that he judges this way. You may not see themselves that way, but that he judges that way, that God is the only one who can change their hearts and minds to be refined and purified, to reflect what is depicted here as gold. That you may be rich... And white garments, choices, acts that are acceptable before God that reflects white garments. It's not just acts, but it's the heart from which the acts come. I've said it before. 
people that represent the Salvation Army and the Red Cross, they go out there to help and assist people. They sacrifice money and their lives to go out and help people in need. They demonstrate a love that human beings can demonstrate, but they don't have the truth. They don't understand these things that have been made available to us. In other words, what God expects of us goes beyond what human beings can express. Reflect back to the statement that Jesus Christ made. Father, forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. The character that Christ displayed at the end was as powerful as anything that he had said his entire life because it represented how he felt. He knew what was right. And instead of thinking of himself and all that had been said to him and all that had been done to him, his thoughts were for other people. White garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed or manifested and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The people he's judging here, and how many times even in my own life did I not see myself the way I should have? Because you get distracted, and you get bogged down in so many things instead of keeping your focus where it should be. The heart, the focus, the love that God expects from us. Verse 19, All of what he's describing in verse 18 is to help his people, rescue his people from a mindset that had grown and progressed in them over years. But it was there. His love is to bring them out of that. Verse 19, as many as I love. And everything, even though it's going to hurt, even though it's painful, God does it because he loves us and wants us in his family. That's That's his purpose. That's his desire. As many as I love, I rebuke, I correct, I convict of sin and chasten. Therefore, if you're one that's under all of that, be zealous and repent. If you look at that word repent, it has a meaning of recovering one's senses. Not deceived to the point where you don't see yourself, but recover what you once had. In other words, these people, perhaps any of us, were once we viewed ourselves as the smallest in the room, progressed to a point where we no longer see ourselves that way. God says you need to be zealous and repent and come back to this, this mindset. What did Job do when he went through all of God's correction? He came back to repent in dust and ashes because once again, he understood how small he was. God is the only protection for him and he's the only protection and guiding force for us. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Number one, you've got to hear, recognize, and respond to the voice. But then you have to choose to open the door. That is in prayer, that is in study, that is in attitude of heart that one has to learn and receive, again, coming from God. Only he can bring this forward. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. How many times have we read through these verses to think of God's people who are doomed to suffer this? But Christ here tells all who may be included in that, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, 
those who are able to hear, you better listen to what's being said, just as the judgment for those in Noah's day, it took years to happen, but the judgment was going to come, so it is for us in our day. How many years have we heard, sat in services of the fire and the brimstone and everything that's going to happen? And yet all these years and all these decades, we've sat here and we hear the same words. Is it possible for us to be calloused, to lose our focus, to not be zealous, to not have this primary in our lives, but to see ourselves as more important than we once did? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The changes that God requires of those involved in this judgment is going to involve pain. It's going to hurt. As Christ was hard-pressed, all of those who live in the last days are going to feel that pressure. They're going to be hard-pressed to give up what God has taught us, what Christ's example displayed, that we are supposed to extend beyond any human love and we're supposed to see God. And we're supposed to focus on following the example that Christ set. When everything is being thrown at us, that our heart and our mind is still for God. So many things that we have to think of. I talk often of how my studies are always done to examine myself. When I think of Revelation 3, I don't think of it as it talking to someone else. I look at it as if it's talking to me. And I have to focus on it that way. This is not something where we're busy worrying about other people. Because I'll tell you this, if you find yourself where all you do is to begin to pick at other people and pick them apart and critique, and they're wrong and this one's wrong and that's wrong, you may already be where Revelation 3 says you are. It can happen to any of us. There have been times I feel that I have been included in that for sure. And I hope that I'm not today. I hope I am seeing more of myself today than I have in the past. But even today, I'm asking God to show me what I don't see because I guarantee you there are blind spots. I guarantee you there are things that I'm not seeing. And all of us are that way. None of us are rich and increased with goods. None of us are to the point that we become proud and boisterous and mighty in our own thinking. We can't allow that to happen. One of the biggest reasons I came to the point of studying Scripture to examine myself is because of verses like this and from the experiences in my own life when I think I'm right, when I think I'm safe, God shows me a deeper understanding where more change is required and more refinement is needed in me examination of ourselves to prove whether we are following the lead of God's Spirit is needed by every single one of us. Don't ever think that you're okay. You're fine. Everybody else has got a problem. Don't subscribe to that. As we prepare for the upcoming Feast of Trumpets, from this point forward, I would like to go through more of a Bible study situation where I want to look more closely at the Olivet Prophecies. It's not just Matthew 24, but it extends into Matthew 25. I want to do more of a Bible study situation, and I want to look at that more closely. But if you would, I want you to turn to Matthew 24 right now. I just, as, as a preamble, I just want to read the first couple of verses that many will say is not part of the Olivet Prophecy, but it is a backdrop 
that I want to consider. Matthew 24, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus came out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. They were very proud. The, if, if you wanted to look back through the historical records, you will see that the rebuilding of the temple began about 19 B.C., and it took about 65 years or so to complete. It wasn't completed till about seven years prior to its destruction in 70 A.D. So when Christ was here, it was about 46 years or so, his first Passover was about 46 years into the rebuilding of the temple. So when the disciples were leaving and they were looking at this construction and the beauty in it, believe me, it was something to behold in their day. Verse 2, and Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. It certainly came to pass physically, but is there spiritual significance in these verses? I just leave that with you if you want to think about that, if you want to go ahead to study Matthew 24 and 25. We'll take, take that up next time. Brethren, if you'll take your songbooks and please stand, <clears throat> we'll sing our final hymn today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turn over to page number four, and we'll sing, Give ear unto my words, O Lord. Again, that's page number four. And after this closing hymn, I'd like to call on Mr. Michael Watts to come forward and give the closing prayer.
Great eternal Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege we have to be here before you, O Lord. We know your son was the example which we should follow and worship. We thank you so much for the message you've given to us. We ask that it inspire us and we take it with us and study and know your words better, Lord. We ask that you please dismiss us and allow us to travel home safely and bring us back for another message. We thank you, Lord God, and ask it all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our soon coming king.